Welcome to Teaching the Truth with Pastor Eric C. Bogan. Clearly define what I am to do. Let every word penetrate the heart. Let what is said lead them running to your arms. Use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. As you know, we've been speaking to you on the subject, the topic of foundations, particularly. We spoke to you last week on the subject of reconciliation. How many was with us last time? We're going to. I thought I was moving on to a different topic, but uh, the Lord says, no, I'm not finished. We're going to talk more about this subject of reconciliation. But we're going to talk about the opposite end of the coin. Amen? Now, as you know, we... We spoke to you and introduced to you last week this topic of reconciliation. We said to you that uh, reconciliation is that process by which man is restored to a peaceful relationship with God. That's what reconciliation is about. It's about uh, having a relationship with God. We said to you that in addition, reconciliation represents a change in condition. And it's, it's not just about a change in relationship. It's a ch it represents a change in condition. In fact, it's the change in a person's condition that allows them to enjoy a change in the relationship with God. We said that the change or, or in reconciliation, God changes or exchanges man's rebellious, hostile condition, or his heart, or we can say his attitude, with one that desires to please God. He takes away that stony heart and gives us one that desires to please God. And we said to you on last week that this is all made possible by the sacrifice of Christ. Go to Romans chapter 5. The reconciliation, this change in relationship, and the change in our condition from having a heart that's hostile towards God to one that is peaceful, that one that desires to please God, this is all made possible because of the sacrifice of Christ. Romans 5 and 10. And it reads, for if when we were enemies, that's hostile, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Verse 11, and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Now, I don't know if you, you see what's happened here is he mentions in verse 10 that it's the death of Christ that brings us into reconciliation with God. And then in verse 11, he defines that death or describes that death as the atonement. The atonement represents the sacrificial death of Christ, the death that brings us into union or reconciles us to God. Now, this word atonement, and we said this to you last time, is translated from the same word that means to be reconciled. And this is why we say that it's the atonement that makes reconciliation possible. This, the fact that we are now in a peaceful relationship with God, the fact that our hearts are now, um, instead of hostile towards God, it's agreeable, we desire to please him. 
That's made possible because of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It brings us into a holy relationship with God. In fact, the atonement allows a sinful man to have a relationship with a holy God. Even before he or she becomes holy. I'll say that again. This atonement allows a sinful man to have a relationship with a holy God while he or she is still learning how to be holy. It's sort of like training wheels. Training wheels on a bike allows a rider who is still learning how to balance themselves, it allows that person to ride a bike even before they've mastered riding. And, somebody say and, and, it allows them to do this without the fear of being hurt or injured. So also the reconciliation. This reconciliation, I mean this atonement, this atoning sacrifice of Christ is what allows us to enjoy fellowship with God even before we have fully become holy and it allows us to do this without the fear of punishment, without the fear of judgment. And this is what we have through the atonement and we have this because what the atonement gives us is a covering. See, the reason why sinful man can be in a relationship with a holy God without being hurt is because the atonement provides a covering for man. In fact, the Hebrew word for atonement not only means reconcile, it means to cover. It's the Hebrew word kephar. And it means to cover, because that's what's happening. When, when, when Christ died on the cross, that sacrifice, that atonement gave us a covering, and that covering allows us to have this relationship with God while we're still learning to be holy, because it covers us. It covers us. Now, somebody say now. now. Having said that, we need to understand that this atonement, this sacrifice, this covering is not available for people who commit willful disobedience. Hebrews chapter 10, turn over there. See, this is the other side. We have a sacrifice, we have an atonement that allows us to be in a relationship with God while we're still learning, but this sacrifice, this atonement, is not available for people who commit willful disobedience. Hebrews 10, 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we've received the knowledge of the truth, Watch, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. And the sacrifice that the writer of Hebrews is referring to here is, of course, the atonement. The atonement. And notice, there's no atonement. There's no covering for people who sin willfully. You, know, you just can't just be defiant and rebellious and intentionally do what you want to do and expect to get a pass. Amen. Your six-month-old might knock over the milk and you say, oh, look at that, that's all right. And you clean that up. But if your 16-year-old do that, you, they might get a different response. There's, there's no pass. 
And why isn't there a past? Do you love the six month old more than you love the 16 year old? No. But you understand that with maturity, with knowledge comes responsibility. Now, what does it mean to sin willfully? What does it mean to sin willfully? According to this verse, to sin willfully means to sin after receiving knowledge of the truth. Now, we have to understand that when the Bible talks about receiving knowledge or this particular word knowledge, it's, it's not the knowledge of, of acquiring facts or information. This word knowledge here in verse 26 is not the knowledge of having facts or acquiring information. This word knowledge is translated from the Greek word epinosis. And it means to obtain the kind of knowledge you have through experience. That's a different kind of knowledge, right? You know, you can, you can read a manual on how to, uh, you know, put something together, but then when you start putting it together, you might say, oh, I see now. So you gain a different level of understanding, a different level of knowledge once you have been involved or have some experience in a thing. And this is what this scripture is talking about. He's not just saying that there's no sacrifice for those who learn the difference between right and wrong. You know, that's what we think. We think that the moment I hear that I shouldn't do this, then now God is holding me responsible to everything I hear. No, no, no. It's a different kind of knowledge that he then holds you responsible for. It's not the knowledge of knowing what's right and wrong. It's the experience of having victory over these things. This word knowledge of the truth. What is the truth? The truth is the fact that Jesus has set us free from all sin. That's the truth. Somebody say the truth. I don't care. I don't care. This is why we say many times when we even when we're praying for healing that you're already healed because the same Jesus that delivered you from all sin has also delivered you from all diseases. That's the truth. Even if you're not experiencing that, what you're experiencing is something that's opposing the truth. And so the Bible tells us to cast down every imagination and every thought that opposes the truth of God's word. We are not to agree with what we see. We are not to agree with what we feel. We are to agree with what God says. And God says you are healed. God also says that you are free from sin from committing disobedience. That's the truth. But we got to gain experience in that. You know what God is saying here? Once you have experience in the knowledge of this truth, meaning once you've experienced victory over sin, it's very dangerous to go back to that sin. I'm going to say that again. Once you gain experience in being delivered from a thing, it's very dangerous to go back to what you experienced victory from. This is why God was so angry with Israel, because after he brought them out of Egypt, they kept wanting to go back. He says, why are you always trying to go back to something I'm delivering you from? In fact, when he delivered them out of there, he closed the sea and said, you're never going back there. See, what we need to realize is that when we get delivered from things, we, there's a responsibility. See, everybody wants to be healed. Everybody wants to receive the power and see the power of God. But with the power of God, with deliverance comes responsibility. This is why Jesus was so angry with Capernaum, which was his hometown, which was the place he performed the most miracles. He says, I'm performing miracles all the time, but you haven't repented. He says, it's going to be it's going to be better for those of Sodom and Gomorrah than from you, because they never seen the miracles you see. He's saying, in other words, when you see deliverance, you're now held at a certain level, a higher level. 
You know, everybody wants their body healed, but when God heals your body, he expects something. Go down there to that hospital and let them take cancer out your body. They're going to expect something. They're going to expect some money. Now, when you're laying dead on the street, they bring you in there, they revive you for free. That's their responsibility. They have a moral obligation to keep you from dying. They have no moral obligation to take cancer out your body. You pay for that. See, people, they come to God. He'll get you out of sin, but then you just want you to just keep going, keep going, keep going, and see the power of God and think God's not going to hold you responsible. He is. Look at Hebrews 20, 10 and 26 again. It says, if we sin willfully, after that we've received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice, no more atonement for sins, verse 27, but a certain, underline that word, certain, fearful, looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Notice that when we sin willfully, meaning sin after we have experience. See, we, see this is not just your, your, your garden variety sin. This is sin committed by people who knows what it's like to be free from something. When God sets you free from pornography, you go back to it, you're gonna, it's going to be trouble. And there are people who are battling with that. That's fine. When God sets you free from cocaine and drug addiction and you go back to it, I'm not talking about somebody who's still battling with it. I'm not talking about people who are still start, trying to work through this. I'm talking about somebody who've experienced victory. You even testified of it. My God, I thank God. God brought me out of that in Jesus. You know what it feels like. You know the power of God in this area. And then you intentionally go back to it. He says, you do, if you do that, you do that at your own peril. He says, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain. And I told you to underline that because he's saying that the judgment that's coming can't be avoided. I mean, you can lay out here and cry all you want to. Say certain. He says, looking for. It means they start looking for. It's going to happen. Don't, oh, I hope it don't. Oh, it's going to happen. You're going, it's going to happen. Are you out there? Looking for of judgment. So you know what that means? When it happens, don't dismiss it as misfortune or coincidence. Oh, you know, you win some and lose some. Oh, no, it just happens to people. <laughs> and see, we, see, this is what we do to God. This is what we do to the world. We, we do not confess that sometimes we bring this stuff on ourselves. We make God out to be a bad parent. Well, we need to tell the world, I brought this one on myself. It's not a coincidence. In fact, I wish I had time to show you, there are no coincidences in life. None, no coincidences, none, zero, no coincidence, meaning every event, every curse that takes place in life has a cause. Proverbs says the curse does not come without a cause. The curse causeless cometh not, it says, meaning there is no curse that comes, no event that comes that didn't have a purpose. He says no more than if a bird is flying in the air automatically falls to the ground. It's been trapped. Something shot it down. Doesn't happen. What's the cause? Now, let me say this. Every cause for the curse isn't always judgment. Meaning, everything that happens in our life that's not good, that's what the curse is, isn't always the result of judgment. Jesus and the apostles ran up against someone who was born blind. And the disciple says, is he blind because of his sin or his parents? sin?" he says, neither. That means not all curses come because there's judgment. 
But he did give a reason for it. He says that the works of God might be manifested in him. Meaning sometimes God lets you come with a, lets you have a lip so he can show you his power. It is sometimes God will give you a difficulty in life just so you can see that he's able to deliver you from everything. Lazarus didn't die because he did something wrong. Jesus says he allowed Lazarus to die that you might see that he is the resurrection and the life. That he's not just a healer that he raises from the dead. He let it happen to show something of himself. Not to show Lazarus that he was evil, but to show something about his power. And some of these things in our life, God put it there so you can look to him and he can show you something. But we don't always do that. We think it's a coincidence, so we let man take care of it. So we got to go through it again. So God can show you, I put it there because I want you to see something about me. Now, having said that, there are still things that happen in our life that is the result of judgment. That means they come in our life because, as Hebrews says, we committed willful disobedience after we've had experience. So God let this come. He caused this to come in order to judge us. Now, let me say this. Somebody say, I'm listening. And see, this is important that we understand this because this never gets talked about. And so, therefore, Christians are walking around all the time scared of everything, scared of this. When Jesus says, don't be scared of nothing, fear no man, only fear God. Because it is God who killeth and maketh alive. See, the only person you should be fearing is God. And when something happens, you need to be going to him and say, Lord, what's up with this? That's what he wants you to do. He wants you to ask him. Now, he might say, I did this so I can show you something, like in the case of Job. Job's friend told him that the reason why he was going through this is because he committed sin. That was a lie. And God said, so you're lying. There's nothing wrong with Job. God was trying to prove something. But sometimes we tell people, ain't nothing wrong with you, when it is. Even in James, he says, he says, he says, if any sick among you, he says, let him call for the elders, let him pray. And if he committed any sin, he shall be forgiven and he shall be healed. So he tells us right there, sometimes you're sick because you've been sinning. No, not the garden variety sin, the rebellious kind. Now, somebody say, I'm listening. When God judges because of this willful disobedience, his judgment isn't always destructive. He's not trying to destroy you. Sometimes his judgment is corrective. 1 Timothy chapter 2, chapter 1. God's not trying to kill you. He's trying to teach you. And that's what we used to do when our parents used to get us. We said, you kill it! No, I ain't trying to kill you. I could kill you, but they say, I brought you in. I could take you out. You're killing me. No, I ain't killing you. I'm teaching you. I'm teaching you. I'm teaching you. And when you go to that schoolhouse, you go. <laughs> and how many know we learned? Matter of fact, we repented right there on that bed. We, I, I never, I'm going to get saved on Sunday. I'm going to get saved. I'm going to get. Was, <laughs> First Timothy, First Timothy chapter one. How many thank God for teaching like this? First Timothy 118, 118. This charge, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee that thou by them might war us a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. Sometimes that shipwreck is your fault. Verse 20, of whom, he calling them out, Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan that they might be destroyed 
that they might learn not to blaspheme. So this is why the devil is still here. This is why the, the Lord Jesus didn't take all the devil and his imps and throw them into the pit. Because he needs the devil to teach us some things. That's why them people are still in your life. Teach you some things. See, we try to get rid of all our, in our enemies. Says, no, 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 no. You need to keep some of them. Even after that, he got suspenders. I remember there was a time back in the 80s, the end thing was suspenders. They got rid of all their belts. They went to the tailor, got tailored up, having put buttons on the inside. How I many remember that? Just sus everybody had suspend. My father used to walk around with suspend. He used to do it like this. He was do it. He would always. That's that's when he was feeling. He was he would do his suspend. He had him in all his pants. He told the put him on everything. But he kept a belt. Now some people was wearing suspenders and a belt. They were confused. They didn't know what they wanted to do. They they couldn't figure it out, so they just had to double. But, but daddy kept the belt, not because he needed to keep his pants up. He needed to keep his children in line. In line. He kept it right there. And Paul is saying here, I delivered them unto Satan. We talk all about, we talk a lot about how the saints have been given power over all the power of the enemy. We talk about how whatever we bind and whatever we loose. But we haven't fully understood that. That when God really gives you his authority, not only can you bind angels, not only can you loose good angels, but you can also loose the devil. I can stop the devil and I can say, go get him. Sick him. See, some of these folk we need to stop praying for, stop praying for, and say, devil, have your way. Only like God told Satan, you don't take their life. What? That they might learn. See, that's my point. The devil can teach you some things. The prodigal son learned some things, and he didn't learn it from his father. He learned it from hard times. Hard times can teach you some things. Difficulties can teach you some things if you know who's holding the belt. Because otherwise, you'll just start screaming at the devil. Satan, the Lord rebuke you. Yeah, see, it's like, well, you don't realize that God's swinging that belt. So judgment is sometimes for the purpose of teaching. Go to Isaiah chapter 26. In fact, somebody say I'm listening. There's rarely any instruction that doesn't involve pain or judgment. Rarely. No real learning can take place. I know these new parents, they think they can teach their kids without ever having to pick up a belt. But them the same ones that when you go to their house, they got all kind of baby carriages and, and gates and you can't even get to the restroom stepping over. You feel like you're in the Olympics hurdling stuff. You just got to. When we were coming up, they didn't have child locks and baby gates. You know what they had? No, don't touch it. I said they didn't have baby gates and child locks. And mama still had her china. She still had the living room. And you wasn't going in there. Oh, you tried to. She started with, don't know. That didn't work. She took the spoon. No. That didn't work. She went a little further. And then, you know, that child learned. I don't know what's in that room, but I just know. I don't want nothing to do with it. And that stayed with you the whole life. You just... It wasn't until you were grown and had kids that you ever sat in the living room. You didn't even know what was in there. I didn't even know what was nice in there. It's so nice in there. I never had the chance. And that's what people want God to do. 
Just put a gate up. Don't let me do it. No, he don't do that. No, he put the tree of good and evil right next to the tree of life. And he said, don't touch it. <laughs> he didn't put no gate around it. Voltage. Skull and bones. No, I don't waste my time. That's too much. See, see, you make parenting too complicated. You got too many rules. My father had very few rules. Do it and see what happens. <laughs> and I just grew up, and before I did something, I was like, hmm. Would daddy approve of that? And you just matured. And that's how God teaches his children. See what happens. Because, you know, you start telling kids, don't jump on the couch. That means I can jump on the bed. See? You'll be making rules to the end of your life. Isaiah 26. Y'all making me sweat for this one. <laughs> Isaiah 26 and 10. Let favor be shown to the wicked, yet will he not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness, he will deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. Keep showing favor to people who are rebellious. They'll never learn. That's what wicked means, to twist. You know what's right, but you twist it. That's wicked. It's not people who are just, you know, your garden variety sinner. He's talking about wicked people who intentionally twist it. You give favor to people like that, and they'll never learn. Rebellious children got to be disciplined. And that's true in the natural. It's true in the spirit. This is why God said there is no favor or sacrifice for the rebellious. Numbers 15, none, zero, no, I, no, you don't get a pass for that because then you won't respect it. In fact, if you read further in Hebrews, he said they despise the, the son of God and the spirit. You're despising it. You're, 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 you're thinking it's nothing. See, if God just let us just go around, do it, you, you wouldn't have any respect for him. You wouldn't have any respect for the blood that sanctifies you. You wouldn't have any respect for the spirit that keeps telling you, don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah, but once we get knocked upside our head enough, we'll respect the Holy One. Numbers 15, 27. And if any soul sin through ignorance, then he shall bring a she-goat of the first year for a sin offering. The sin offering is for those who commit sins in ignorance. Now, the sin offering here is a reference to the atonement. Can prove it to you. Look at verse 28. Verse 28. And the priest shall make an atonement for the soul that sinneth, what? Ignorantly. When he sinneth by ignorance before the Lord, to make an atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. See, the sin offering or the atonement is for those who commit sin in ignorance. And that's the purpose of the atonement. The purpose of the atonement is to allow the ignorant, those who are still learning about what it means to walk in God's righteousness, to be holy, it allows those people People, those children to still have fellowship with the Holy God. The atonement makes this possible legally. But there's no atonement for those who commit sins intentionally. Now, again, when the Bible says ignorant, he, he doesn't, it doesn't mean a lack of knowledge. Oh, I just didn't know. We think that the only sins that God overlooks are those sins that we commit because we didn't know it was a sin. He certainly does overlook those times when we do something that we don't know. In fact, it's not a sin until we know. 
He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. But we have to understand that when the Bible talks about ignorance, at least in the New Testament, it doesn't just include knowledge of what's wrong, it also includes experience in having victory over it. Romans chapter 7, I'll show you. It includes weaknesses, in other words. Because in God's eyes, you're ignorant not only when you don't know it's right, you're also ignorant when you don't know how to overcome it. It's weakness. You don't know how. You don't know how. You know it's wrong, but you don't know how to stop doing this. You know you shouldn't do it, but I don't know how to stop smacking people. I know I shouldn't be going on, but I don't know how to stop. I've been smacking people my whole life. Romans chapter 7, verse 18. Paul says, I know, look at the word know, that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how? To perform that which is good, what? I know it's wrong, but I don't know how to stop. And he says later, there's no condemnation to such a person. Not only who doesn't know what's wrong, but there's no condemnation to those who don't know how to stop doing what is wrong. So this is a limited thing we're talking about here. We're not talking about, you know, when you're coming to God, that everything you do, you know, everything happens, God's judging you, God's judging you, God's judging you, only for those people who've had experience being free from that. And now you intentionally go back to it. You cannot do that without the danger of being judged. And that judgment is for your good to teach you to reverence God, to teach you where the line is. How I many know we didn't know where the line is? We didn't know how far we can go. Don't go that you went too far. I hate to use my brother, but sometimes... He turned 16, he just, you know, he started drawing, driving, and he would just come in. One night he came in at 9.30, we were evening. What up, Dad? And my brother was always like that. He was just, you know, I don't know if it's pride. Yeah, it is pride, but anyway. <laughs> then it, it was 10.30. Then it became 11.30. He came in one night. My dad was cool, man. He was sitting there on the couch. My brother came in from the garage. And I didn't even see my dad move. It was like, you know how the Bible says Jesus passed through the midst. I don't know if he, if he was translated. Next thing I know, my brother was up against the wall. If you ever. That's all I heard. Then I went downstairs. I didn't want to be a part of it. But you know what? He learned where the line was. Uh, I think that's too late. I better get home. Amen? We learned something. We learned something. But again, he says there's no sacrifice for sins when we commit them with knowledge. After we've gained experience over that sin. Over that sin. I mean, you know, the, you know what that tells us? That tells us that this atonement that brings us into fellowship with God, this covering, is a temporary thing. See, we, we try to treat this like a forever type of thing. That now that I'm with Christ, I can just do what I want to do and just say, Lord, forgive me. It's like what the Bible talks about in the book of Proverbs when the strange woman saw the man coming. He says, she went and got sacrifices. And he told the man to come and lay with her because her husband was out on a business trip. And, he, and she says, relax, don't worry, I've got sacrifices so when we get done, we can make sacrifices and ask God to forgive us, in other words. And that's what we do. I'm going to put my jacket down, kick your head in, and then ask God to forgive me. Well, you do that, then he's going to kick your head in. Amen. We, we just treat the atonement as a get-out-of-jail-free card. Oh, 
but we're going to learn that you keep going around the board and going to jail. You're going to stay there. You're going to miss a turn. Say, I'm going to miss a turn. I'm going to miss a turn. That's the Lord. He's teaching us. There's, so this atonement is a meantime thing. It's, it's only for the inexperienced. And if we go back to our original illustration about training wheels, how many know training wheels is only for the inexperienced? It's, it's not for the kid that's 16. You shouldn't be riding around with training wheels. Training wheels only come on kids' bikes. The atonement is just for babies. For the inexperienced, in other words. Because as we grow in experience, you know what God does? He starts removing the covering. You know, you, you're laying in bed. You know, you got this covering, got this covering. But as the sun starts going up in our life, as we start getting more light, in other words, I mean, them covers start coming off. So more of ourselves starts getting exposed. And in order for us to remain in a healthy relationship with God, we can't cover our sins. We're going to have to get them cleansed. Go to Psalms 51. So this is what the church hasn't understood. The covering is only a temporary thing. You were wondering, man, you, like when you first got saved, it's like you was above the law. It didn't matter what you did, you still got touched on Sunday morning. You were out all night Saturday doing whatever you wanted to do, but the power of God still fell on you on Sunday morning. And you was like, whoa, God is good. But after a while... You kept doing what you wanted to do all Saturday. But when you came on Sunday morning, it, it didn't fall on you. It fell everywhere else. And he was like, what's wrong? The cover's off. God's holding you responsible. There's no more covers. Psalm 51, verse 16. Notice what David says. Psalm 51, verse 16. He says, for thou desireth not sacrifice, else would I give it. But thou delightest not in what? This psalm was written by David, according to my Bible, after he committed adultery with Bathsheba, which was a willful disobedience. Yeah, he knew what he was doing because even after he did it, he had his, her husband killed to cover it up. And the prophet came in and said, you in trouble. He says, God would have given you any woman to be your wife. As a matter of fact, he had more than one wife. The prophet basically said, if you wanted a wife, God would have gave you a wife. Why'd you have to take another man's wife? You're just, you just did that intentionally. And so God began to judge David. And you know what David says here in this verse? He says, if you wanted sacrifice for me, I would have given it. But in this case, you don't want sacrifice. You've got to remember in that day, sacrifices were still being offered. But God says, not for David. I don't want no atonement. No, no atonement can fix this. So David was, he was that zero. He knew there was no sacrifice he could do to remove this judgment from him. And that's what we need to understand. You can have pastor pray for you all you want. You can have the saints lay hands on you all you want. But this ain't coming off. I just need somebody to understand this. He doesn't accept sacrifice, atonement for willful disobedience. So what do you do? Feel like this song. What do you do? What do you do when you've committed willful disobedience and there's no sacrifice, no atonement available to you? Well, first, you accept, you, you, you accept this judgment in humility. You know, humility is a sacrifice. Look at verse 17. Verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, thou will not. 
He will never reject you. He will never despise the sacrifice of brokenness or humility. Even when he won't allow Christ to be your stand in here, he will always accept the sacrifice of humility. See, that's what David had to do. The prophet couldn't do this for him. The priest couldn't do this for him. David had to break down. And this is what we need to do. Stop walking around like we entitled. God, how can you do this? And we need to say, you know what? I'm wrong. See, this is what people don't do. They, they, they go their whole life and never admit. Way back then, you were wrong. Therefore, you live with this for so many years because you just never said, Lord, you're right. Meaning, stop saying this was misfortune. No, God's right. I deserve that one. Amen, Lord. In fact, real humility will include confession. Look at verse 1 of, of Psalm 51. Look at verse 1. Hey, man, somebody. Amen. Have mercy on me. Yuck. Now, no, don't give me what I deserve. Have mercy, Have mercy. on me, O oh God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Don't cover it up. Cleanse me. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin, I ain't trying to hide it, is ever before me. This is what God requires when we sin willfully. Repentance. Humility. Confession. And you know what David is doing here? He's appealing to God for mercy. You know what an appeal is? I looked it up. An appeal is a request made to a higher court to reverse the decision of a lower court. An appeal is a request to a higher court to reverse the judgment of a lower court. And you know what David appeals to? Not God's justice. He appeals to God's mercy because mercy is higher than judgment. Lord, I know you judge me, but you're more merciful. In fact, you love mercy and more than judgment. So he appeals not to the righteousness of God. He appears to the, appeals to the mercy of God to reverse what's been handed down by God's judgment. And it worked. I said it worked. So that's the first thing, confession, humility. The second thing we need to do, the second sacrifice God does receive, receive from such rebellious and willful disobedience is that of obedience. Romans 12, I'm going to show you. Go to Romans 12. You lay the foundation here. Oh, my. I remember the man who was healed by Jesus, who was born blind. He said a, a very um, revelatory thing. He says, God heareth not sinners, but if any man become a worshiper. <laughs> if any man become a worshiper and doeth his will, he heareth them. Even when God won't hear you, when you've been any, if any man, rebellious or otherwise, become a worshiper, meaning doing God's will, God will hear him. And so you know what he does there? He tells us what true worship is. Obedience. It's not just, oh Lord, no, Obedience. I'm going to prove it to you. Romans 12 and 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, notice, by the mercies of God, 
that you present your bodies a living. See, don't look for the atonement. Give your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable. God's going to accept it, which is your what? That word means spiritual worship. This is your work. You, you want to be a worshiper of God? You want God to hear you? Worship him by giving your body. That's what David says. If you deliver from me, if you deliver me from this, he says, I'll teach transgressors your ways. I'll do what's right. I'll do what's right. See, when you commit a sin that's willful, you know what God's looking for? A change of attitude to the point that you change your actions. Not just, Lord, please forgive me. No, change. And he'll take that off of you. Come on, somebody. First John chapter 1. See, presenting your body is a form of spiritual worship. And you know, presenting your body or doing God's will, you know what it also does? It brings you into fellowship or back into fellowship. Oh, my God. First John chapter one. Come on, somebody. First John one and seven. But if we walk in the light. As he is in the light, we have what? One with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son. What? Not covers, cleanses us from all sin. Walking in the light is a metaphor for doing God's will. When you walk in the light, when you obey and do God's will, it says it brings you into fellowship. And he says that fellowship would also cleanse you from sin. I'm convinced there's certain so many people who are out there trying to fellowship with God through a covering when God's requiring a cleansing. You're lacking fellowship, not because you don't have a covering. You're lacking fellowship because you're not being cleansed. And you're not being cleansed because you're not obeying what you know to obey. See, you can go so long where God will say, to have fellowship with me now, you're going to have to start doing this. And see, this is what I believe. I, I believe in my heart that we take one or two stances, either we, we tell people that you cannot have a relationship with God unless you do everything he tells you to do. Or we say that you can do whatever you want to do and still have a relationship with God. I'll say it again. We either tell people you can't have a relationship with God. You can never have a relationship with God unless you're doing everything he tells you to do. Or we tell them you can do whatever you want to still have a relationship with God. When the truth is, you can do what you want to do as long as it's not in rebellion and have a relationship with God. As long as you're inexperienced, as long as you have no knowledge of how to walk in victory, you can, in that state, still have a relationship with God even when you're not doing everything right. But God will require you sooner or later to do his will in order to maintain that relationship with God. Second Chronicles 12, and I'm almost done here. Now, I'm going to say this, and I'm ending with this. Even though God will forgive disobedience, even willful disobedience, Anybody a witness out there? He will still require that you endure some consequences for your sin as part of his, his discipline. So even after he forgives you, he will still require when David committed adultery with Beersheba and killed her husband, God did forgive him but God still punished David. That's why Absalom was able to take the kingdom from him. That's also why he lost his child, the first child between him and Bathsheba, 
because he was still ignorant. He, he hadn't repented yet. He hadn't repented until after the prophet came and told him that that child you had is going to die too. But David repented, and guess what? Bathsheba had another child, and it was king over all Israel. See, this is the Lord. Are you listening to me? I'm saying to you that even when God judges you, he'll use that thing to send you up higher. He worketh all things, even the bad things, together for your good. Solomon became one of the greatest kings Israel ever known, and it came out of an adulterous relationship that David got mercy for because he repented the right way. God will take this thing that's ruined your life and turn around and be the best thing that happened to you. But you've got to repent, and you've got to walk in the light. 2 Chronicles 12 and 7. And when the Lord saw that they had humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah saying, they have humbled themselves, therefore I will not destroy them, but I will grant them some, somebody say some, deliverance, and my wrath shall not be poured out upon Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. Nevertheless, they shall be his servants that they may know or learn my service and the service of the kingdoms of the countries. He says, I know you humbled yourself, that's good. And I'm gonna forgive you. But I'm only gonna give you some deliverance. Not too much. Why? So you can learn the difference between serving me and serving the world. Because that's what happens. That's why you went into willful disobedience. You thought it was better to disobey me and obey the flesh. And I'm gonna show you that it's harder to obey the flesh than to just do what I told you to do. Amen. How many know after you go through some things, you realize, you know, it's easier to go home when you're done Amen. and not to the hotel. Amen. Somebody say easier. easier. Easier just to do it. Amen. Because if I don't do it, then I go through all this stuff. So you're going to get enough, keep following people after you go through all this stuff. It took you six months to come out of this thing. And you just let somebody else drag you back into it. But if you go through that enough times, you're going to say, you know what? It ain't worth it. Hanging out with you, I done learned where the line is. Whenever I hang out with you, I spend six months trying to get this thing back together. It ain't worth it. When I gossip on Facebook, I had to take six months to come out of this. It ain't worth it. When I get on that internet and start surfing pornography, it takes me six months to come out from on it. It ain't worth it. it ain't worth it. Oh, the Lord will teach you. Serving me is far easier than serving the devil. You're going to learn. It might take some time, but God's a good teacher. He's been doing this a long time. But what we need to do is stop blaming the enemy and say, yes, Lord, to humble ourselves, to break our own will. Say, I can't fight with God. I can't do it my way and expect to win. So we love to do. We love to do it our way and then tell God, okay, fix this. No, no, it's like, see, that's not going to work. You got to do it my way. I mean, people do this all the time. God tell you, don't marry that man. You marry him anyway. And then you wonder why you got all the trouble. Because I told you not to. But we try to cover it up. We'll marry him and then we'll bring him to church and say, God save him. See, somebody said, that's a cover-up. What we should have did is say, God save them and then marry them. God would have honored that prayer more. I mean, God wants to save them. But he wants you to have some principle. Bring them here. Have God save them. Then marry them. Rather than the flip. Marry them and, still, and, and then nag them about getting saved. That's backwards. Uh, pastor just don't want me to be happy. No, I'm trying to save you from heartache. 
Ask some of these women over here. Over, I don't mean over here. I'm just meaning. You should have saw them. They was like, me? Don't be pointing at me. You know? I'm saying ask some of these individuals who've went through this. They'll tell you, child, it ain't worth it. I'm trying to help somebody. The devil trying to trick you. The safest place to be is in the will of God. You can't do it your way and expect God to bless it. He might bless it, but you're going to have to go through some pain. Yeah. Bow your heads today. Oh, Father, I pray that we would learn. We would learn that deliverance comes at a price. That the more we know, the more you require. To much is given, much is required. And I want to thank you, Father, for your method of discipline. The way you teach us. It's a good way. It's good. It's good. It's good. My flesh might complain, but I say today from my spirit, amen. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. You do all things well. What we need is to humble ourselves. Stop fighting the plan of God. Stop fighting the will of God. Father, give us a spirit, a contrite spirit. Give us to acknowledge our sin, not hide it. And Lord, give us to walk in the light. We know what to do. We've been trained what to do. It's time to do it. And as we go, we will be healed. Because you promised to work all things together. All things together for our good. We thank you for this promise. In Jesus' name, amen. Give me what to say. Let me hear you. Thank you for listening. If this teaching has been a blessing to you and you'd like to partner with our ministry to share the message of Jesus Christ, please visit our website at www.hmclive.org and click the donate button. If you're in our area, we invite you to join us at 4317 Lippincott Boulevard, Burton, Michigan, 48519, Harris Memorial Church of God in Christ, Teaching the truth and showing the love. Use me, Lord.